Kaya Nonoko. Before I begin, I would like to say Bulayana to Ani Sandy for welcoming us onto Yagara country here. I would like to acknowledge all Torobo and Yagara peoples as the traditional custodians of the country that we're all lucky enough to be here today. I'd like to pay my respects to all elders, past, present, and emerging, and to the traditions and practices that have always and continue to care for country. I would also like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the ongoing strength of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in practicing culture and maintaining identity, and acknowledge that these lands were never ceded, always was and always will be Aboriginal land. So, <laughs> the first meaningful question we're asked in our lives is, what do you want to be when you grow up? Even at a young age, we know that this question has a series of right answers and wrong answers. At the age of five, when I answered fire truck, I was quickly rebutted with, don't you mean fireman or doctor or astronaut? I could tell even then that through the body language of my teacher that these titles were important for what I should want to be. Unfortunately for her, I was pretty stubborn with, no, no, I mean the truck. <laughs> As we move through school, we start the journey to figure out who we are. We make friends and join groups with social titles of their own. Jock, nerd, class clown, overachiever, misfit, rebel, most likely to succeed. We subconsciously learn that these titles are how we fit into the world, shape the opportunities that will be presented to us, the value we have in our communities, and set the limitations or possibilities of what our future might hold, and essentially form the foundation of how we begin to value ourselves and the people around us. Later, as we finish school, almost, we're asked that simple question again. What do you want to be when you grow up? Only this time there's a sense of pressure. You feel the weight of your response. You know the series of right answers that we met with support and applause, and the series of wrong answers that we met with scrutiny and dismissal. You also know that your existing social title has a part to play in what you should or should not answer. The limitations or possibilities of that title, now as loud as an orchestra through the silent and subtle raising of your teacher's eyebrow. Of course, you answer doctor, you answer lawyer, architect, scientist, and you're met with that subtle sigh of relief. Or the dissuading face of pity. Years later, you finish your degree your dissertation, you walk with pride, wearing your new title, wearing the blood, sweat, tears, sleepless nights that you have endured to earn this title. Your parents introduce you with stars in their eyes, sharing your title with the people around you. We learn that now as a professional, this is how we fit into this world. We'll shape the opportunities that will be presented to us, the value we have in our society, and we'll set the limitations or possibilities or the future that we've created might hold. As time moves on, we attend events and socialize with other professionals. Only it's no longer making friends or connecting as human beings, it's networking. <laughs> Strategically framed to evaluate how these other professionals might be of service to us or enhance our value in society. In that moment, we're no longer human beings. We're a commodity, a product. We're a professional. <laughs> it seems the further we outwardly disassociate from our struggles, our humanities, the more successful we are, the greater role models we become. We only see true value and hear true knowledge in those we now deem to be professionals. We're subtly handed the professional hall pass in life. We now know a guy. We don't need to see our families as much because you see it's going to be a late one in the office. We're excused from a degree of moral judgment because we're just doing our jobs, right? We're excused from a degree of moral inaction because you see that's someone else's job. The very way we 
um, interact with the world is now predicated on the validity and supremacy we find in our job titles. Common personality traits of compassion, curiosity, and contentment are cast aside in favor of what we do for a living. The cultural romanticism of what we do, the commodity we produce, the service we provide, even our words, irrespective of malice or falsehood, are given agency if you're the right kind of professional. Maybe a politician. <laughs> we learn that so far that our, in our lives that we are only as valuable as our position within an economy. But of course, this story of education and professional privilege is not true for everyone. It wasn't true for me. Not everybody has the ability to access higher education or education at all. Some simply don't have the life stability or flexibility to pursue a career that is deemed of value to society. Some just find passion and interest in other paths in life, but irrespective of our uniqueness or our, the complexities of our lives, we are all held to these career-based judgment systems the same. This system not only ostracizes, but actively devalues those not deemed to be part of an acceptable career or a professional role. It then causes those same people to then devalue themselves and accept a limitation on what they can contribute to the world. In my youth, I struggled for many years with the idea that one voice was worth more than another. I struggled with years of drug addiction, escapism, and a refusal to accept that we as a society were so eager to dictate who was of value and then how we should or should not value ourselves. At no point during this time, though, did I feel like I had nothing to contribute, but rather that society did not want to hear my contribution an experience and emotion so common to so many people that are convinced that their value is worth less than someone in a suit. Now, I'm not saying we should turn around and forego our careers or, or, or feel a sense of guilt in the pride that we carry for what we do. As was said, I stand here very proudly as a senior lecturer here at QUT, a principal landscape architect and an Aboriginal design consultant. But that is not what defines me or my value in society. I am defined by my love for the trees and streams, by my love for country, the way I care and connect with the people around me, some of which are in this room. Hey, Mum. <laughs> by my values, my life experiences. And that is true for each and every one of you sitting here today. Because you are not your profession. You are so much more. You are a rich tapestry of all the events in your life up until this moment. You are your values your community, your culture. You are the way you connect with the people around you and the way that you contribute and can contribute to the world are limitless, beyond comprehension. By reshuffling this hierarchy of values and identity, it becomes easy to see what these career-based judgment systems for what they are, an illusion. If you were to take away your career, forego your title, who are you? Who are you surrounded by? What fills you with joy and gives you purpose? We must realize the true strength in ourselves and each other comes from our connections, our values, our morality, the accountability of our actions. We must understand that if we do so, we open up the possibilities to truly connect and listen and learn from one another. See that what we do as a profession is just one of the many, many tools we all bring to any given situation in time. 
and to come together in a powerful moment as agents of change and human beings in a rich and beautiful world that is worth looking after. We live in a tumultuous time. We live in a time of great social and ecological outcry. We are facing challenges never before seen by humanity that require a great shift in our understanding of ourselves and each other. We must understand, as I said, <laughs> that our true strength comes from our values. It should not be related to our position within an economy. And so, I have something to ask of you. For the parents, the elders, teachers, role models, the friends, brothers, sisters, and those in this room who may feel completely alone. The next time you are talking with a child or a teenager, do not ask them what they want to be when they grow up. The next time you are feeling a sense of limitation of what you can achieve in this world, do not devalue yourself to the imaginary, romanticized confinements of a professional title. Instead, empower yourself. Empower the ones looking to you for lessons by instead asking, how will you change the world? Buleana, no, no, quote.